And Greg, um, once we get done with the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the use of wrap and pavement preservation treatments conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be given at that time. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star then zero on your telephone keypad. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Jason Dietz, with Federal Highway Resource Center. Please go ahead. Thank you, Kathy. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jason Beats, and I'm with the Federal Highway Resource Center, and I'm partnering today with the Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance, PPRA, on a series of pavement preservation webinars focusing on pavement preservation. Today's webinar will focus on the use of RAP in pavement preservation treatments. You'll see a number of polls up on your screen. We ask you to take a moment to answer those, and we will close them in just a few minutes as the, as the presentation begins. We also encourage questions. So during the webinar, if you have any questions, please take the time to respond to, the, uh, to them in the chat pod. If we get a chance, we'll answer them as, as time permits. But if not, we'll, uh, we'll save them to the end. And if we don't be able to finish them, um, along with the minutes as well as the presentation material, we'll have them in a separate uh, file for you. Also, I want to take the time to, uh, to say and, and speak about the evaluations at the end of the webinar. They're very key for us for helping for future webinars, so I ask you to please take the time to fill them out appropriately. It look, I appreciate it because it gives, us, it gives us the information that we need for future webinars. All attendees are on mute, but you can submit any questions through the chat, as I mentioned. We are offering PDHs for today's webinar upon request. So please let us know after the webinar if you would like those, if you would like to receive those. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Greg Duncan. Greg Duncan is a senior engineer at Applied Pavement Technology, uh, his, and he has been with them for 29 years in pavement materials, construction, and roadway maintenance engineering. His work at Aptech is focused on highway maintenance, pavement preservation, and the evaluations for both highways and airfields. Prior to joining Aptech, uh, Greg Duncan was the Assistant Chief Engineer of Operations for the Tennessee Department of Transportation. During his 22-year career with Tennessee DOT, he held other positions as a State Maintenance Engineer, Regional Director for West Tennessee, and a State uh, Bituminous Engineer. Greg resides in Spokane, Washington, where he enjoys traveling, skiing, and explaining the southern Midlands in the Great Pacific Northwest. Greg, on behalf of PPRA and FHWA, I want to thank you for your time today, and I would now like to pass it over to you. Great, Jason. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sure can. All right. Thanks very much. And uh, thank you all for being here. This is quite an esteemed uh, group of participants in this uh, web meeting today, and I am privileged to be able to talk with you today about a, a project we did for FHWA, uh, I guess it started back in 2016, and it, it's recently been a uh, published report. Uh, so there's a, a link to that report in the, in the chat box. Uh, I welcome your uh, review of that. Uh, it's, uh, I know that several folks have been looking forward to the publishing of that to, to use in other research and uh, just observe what the state of the practice is on use of RAP in surface treatment. So uh, I want to cover just a few of the chat boxes here uh, as sort of preliminary information before we get into the, into the presentation. Um, it, it appears that nearly half of our group uh, calls himself an expert in reclaimed asphalt pavement. Uh, and that's, a, that's always a, a difficult designation for me to determine uh, for myself whether I would consider myself an expert. But 
uh, we provided that uh, guideline there. If you've been working in this for more than five years, we we uh, figure you've seen most of the uh, nuances of using RAP uh, and and all the different uh, varieties that it comes in. Uh, the um, we also see the next question: uh, How is the quantity of reclaimed asphalt pavement changing in your area? And uh, 35% of respondents say that uh, the quantity is increasing. 30% uh, say that the quantity is stable. Only 6% say the quantity is reducing. So that's eight, eight folks out there. Uh, and 42 people, uh, respondents, have said, I have no idea. And that's the, that's the case that I generally find myself in. Um, without working directly with uh, wrap managers and uh, producers in the in the industry so uh, it's uh, interesting to see that so many folks are seeing wrap quantities increase based on the the review of uh, information produced by NAFA that's uh, it's generally thought that the quantity is increasing or remaining stable uh, depending on market conditions. So uh, I have heard anecdotally from a few folks that the quantity uh, in their area is reducing. So each of us may find ourselves in a different climate for the, the quantity of wrap uh, in that general area. Uh, another question uh, talks about the availability of fractionation equipment. Uh, it seems like that is becoming uh, prevalent. In many areas, two-thirds of our respondents said uh, fractionation equipment is uh, available in your area. Um, so one of the questions is, why are you here? And I know a lot of you came to uh, hear Steve Cross speak uh, a little later on, uh, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, the uh, Many of you may think there are benefits uh, connected with using RAP in pavement preservation surface treatments. Uh, and 78% uh, identify cost savings to be a uh, benefit. 69% uh, said sustainability goals, about the same uh, for a reduced demand for virgin aggregates. 25% uh, say increased supply competition. So. Um, those are all benefits that have been seen in the industry, so you are right on line with uh, what some of the users of RAP and surface treatments have, have identified, so you're, uh, you're right on target with those responses. Uh, and the last question, uh, what primary concerns do you have for using RAP and surface treatments? And so we had so many folks identify themselves as having lots of experience, and I can see from uh, recognizing your names that we do have a lot of uh, senior folks that are uh, used to dealing with RAP and some of the um, nuances and, and uh, issues that may accompany its use, things that we have to overcome. Certainly, uh, a few of you said uh, because it's a dirty aggregate, uh, but more responses uh, are there, less quality control done by the contractor on RAP, and we don't really see uh, design criteria. So those are some of the things uh, that we'll try to address through uh, the presentation today. Uh, only a few responses said uh, it will not work in my area, so I would encourage you to keep an open mind. Um, as we go through, ask questions that you have. Uh, I'd also enjoy seeing what your uh, obstacles are. What are the hindrances uh, to to doing this process? Perhaps that can be uh, addressed at the end of the at the end of the presentation. So, um, the the last response there, my agency does not have access to a wrap supply, and so that's a few of your. Uh, feelings there so uh, or observations so uh, those are all 
valid concerns, and, and we'll try to uh, talk about those as we go through the presentation today. So again, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Jason will be uh, watching the chat box as we as we go through, and if there's a, a question that I haven't touched on, uh, he'll bring that to my attention, and we'll try to get those responded to as quickly as possible. So, again, he introduced me as Greg Duncan. I am with Applied Pavement Technology Incorporated. We are a proud member of ISSA, and very pleased to be a uh, participant in the in the PPRA uh, network and uh, being it grow and being involved, that's one of the benefits that we find for professional development in our own uh, organization. So uh, we're happy to be here and happy to be presenting to you. Um, so what do we know about RAP? Uh, a lot of these things have been touched on in your in your poll questions there at the beginning. We know that it is a valuable byproduct. Uh, Many agencies uh, find that reusing wrap, uh, which is reclaimed asphalt pavement, reusing that material in hot mix asphalt or uh, asphalt mixtures uh, is the most economical use of that uh, product or that commodity. And I, I always like to think of these uh, sources of, uh, when we're going to be using thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of uh, materials, uh, they are a commodity, and so we have to be aware of what the what the value of that commodity is, what's its best, uh, highest intended use. I mean, uh, uh, I don't want to. Uh, sell a product that uh, isn't, isn't uh, worthwhile, but RAP is a valuable byproduct. Not only is it a uh, substitute for virgin aggregate, it's also to some extent a substitute for that asphalt cement. And I've got a, a, a nice note that I kept from uh, Dr. Don Brock down at Aztec uh, selling my commissioner on the value of RAP materials. And uh, if any of y'all have sat under uh, Dr. Brock in years past for uh, some of the lectures that he gave, um, you know the the passion that he presented on uh, using RAP to its its highest end product. So um, it is a valuable byproduct, and we need to be aware of of what those uses are. Uh, generally, RAP comes from a high quality source. Of aggregate in particular, uh, it, it also has that asphalt coating on there. From a material behavior standpoint, some people uh, believe that RAP acts mainly as a black rock or a, an aggregate with that coating on there. While in some circumstances, we do get some interactivity uh, with the virgin binder that's being added uh, along with what what is accompanying that aggregate into the process. Uh, and certainly from a baseline, we need to be able to uh, process wrap, whether it's uh, going to be used in a, uh, an asphalt mixed plant environment or in our surface treatments that we're going to be talking about for pavement preservation. We need the capability to take it from this God only knows pile into a managed product of known properties uh, so that it's predictable and uh, that it's uh, able to be used within our processes under good quality control uh, practices. So when we looked at where the um, experience was in using RAP and surface treatments, uh, we really only found a few instances of published information. Uh, largely, that information was available for, uh, relating to California's experience, largely Southern California, and we found a project in New Mexico uh, that had been done by the uh, New Mexico DOT looking at 
what is the best use of wrap materials in uh, maintenance practices there for New Mexico. So we set off to gather information by talking to some of the recognized experts uh, in, in the arena that we knew were using um, pavement preservation treatments containing RAP. Uh, many of these are ISSA, ARRA, AEMA uh, members here and, and fantastic participants in uh, the PPRA organization. So we're uh, really uh, pleased that these folks were able to devote some time and talk to us about uh, their practices and determining uh, how these materials worked for them and how the uh, preservation treatments performed uh, over the years as they perfected or uh, worked with the materials. Uh, so thank you to those folks. Uh, what we found from those interviews is that people use RAP for different reasons. So uh, agencies may uh, decide to use RAP because it's a cost-effective alternative. Uh, they may use it to uh, promote the environmental sustainability of their arm of the uh, industry, and it's an alternative to scarce aggregate resources. So those are all sort of interrelated uh, reasons, but they were very defined uh, and mentioned uh, in particular by the public agencies that we were um, dealing with there or, or talking to. Uh, what we found uh, just in those uh, interviews uh, was that uh, there were some differences in using wrap materials as compared to virgin, virgin aggregates. Uh, you may see an acronym in the report um, called RAG, capital R, little A-G-G. -G. So that's, that stands for the wrap aggregate. Uh, and so we, we talked about the different materials uh, and what those characteristics were. Uh, for chip seal characteristics, we found that that rag uh, had a better bond capability than virgin aggregate. It was very similar to uh, the idea of using a pre-coated aggregate uh, for chip seals. Uh, and the, the respondents noted that the color of the rag was darker, blacker, and it uh, stayed darker for longer, gave them uh, good contrast for pavement markings and things like that. So those were some of mainly anecdotal experience for using uh, wrap aggregates in chip seals. Uh, when we looked at microsurface and slurry seal <clears throat> characteristics, um, designers and users of the material noted that uh, when you do a mixed design with RAF aggregates, uh, you end up oftentimes with a lower optimum virgin asphalt emulsion content. So that could be 1% to 2%. Uh, that's an economic savings. It's also, uh, given that most fine rag contains 6 to 7% asphalt, you end up with a higher asphalt content in the total mix. So that is um, perhaps a benefit uh, to long-term performance, having additional asphalt in that mixture. Uh, but one difference was noted that there uh, is a slower set time, that uh, wrap aggregate has less surface area as compared to a, a crushed fine aggregate, uh, and uh, it's not quite as reactive with the asphalt emulsion material. So it's a little bit slower set. You need to take a little bit more care uh, in application then. Uh, and so talking with those folks, we identified several case studies uh, to try to go extract findings on exactly how did this material work and perform. So the first one I'd like to cover is with the National Center for Asphalt Technology down in uh, Opelika, Alabama. 
Uh, we had uh, two chip seal comparison sections uh, placed on the test tracks. So if you if you've been there, you can sort of get the context for where these uh, sections are. Uh, one section was placed with a wrap uh, coarse aggregate, uh, while the other one was placed with a pre-coated number seven uh, granite material locally available there. And uh, the findings from uh, this test, the, the materials were then loaded with those uh, design number of easels that the, the test track was using there. Uh, what they found is um, that the materials performed very similarly. Um, they used a, a rubber modified hot applied chip seal for both of those. Uh, they loaded and monitored the, the performance for two years, uh, which is not necessarily what you expect a uh, pavement preservation treatment to do for you, withstand those loads for two years. Um, but the, uh, what they showed, what they found was in the wrap aggregate that the skid data identified just a little bit lower friction uh, than the pre-coded number seven. And that, I suspect that is due to the chemical makeup of the source aggregate to, to have a half inch uh, chip material left in a wrap pile, you have to start with a coarser mix than that, right? So it to be crushed and processed down to a half inch uh, uniform size, we're generally looking at a binder layer of, of material that may not be in that surface approved uh, layer for um, the Alabama DOT. So uh, while this was a finding for those sections, it's not necessarily a concern uh, if you're monitoring the source of that aggregate. So uh, just be aware that that may, may happen if you're using a, a pretty coarse uh, source material that may not be surface approved. Uh, a lot of our wrap products are surface materials that have been um, reclaimed and we're um, able to take advantage of reusing surface aggregate over and over again. So uh, NCAP basically found uh, that the results were pretty comparable. Um, Greg, I see we I have see a it. question about the virgin aggregate was a number seven. Correct, yes. Okay. They call that out as a number seven. Uh, the best I could tell, the the gradation of the wrap chip, the top size, it was 100% passing a three quarters. Uh, so basically a half inch size chip seal, which would be pretty comparable to a, uh, a number seven produced material. So that's, that's going to be consistently one of the issues that we talk about. Uh, in using wrap is we, we have to sort of accept that wrap uh, is what it is, and when you process it and screen it, that's what you're left with uh, unless you're, you're adding a, another aggregate into it or, or blending some aggregates. So um, that's one of the areas that we advise, advise folks to keep an open mind about as they go through the go through the design process or specifications. So thank you for that question. Uh, we also went to a uh, treatment designer and uh, tried to understand how they evaluate these products to assign a um, optimum mixture design components, how do they determine the emulsion content that's right for this uh, material. And so we went to talk to um, Mike down at uh, Paragon Technical Services. Uh, thank you to Mike for allowing us to come in there. Uh, and the results of, of his case study, he is a fine hand model there. We appreciate his uh, willingness to uh, be involved. <laughs> The, um, so their, their business model is to provide mixture design uh, often for clients. They do check 
chip seals as well as microsurface and slurry seal designs. Uh, and, and basically what they found is that they can have very similar performance uh, in the laboratory for uh, wrap mixtures and specifically we were looking at the slurry and micro uh, surface processes there using the wet track abrasion and the loaded wheel test. Uh, they also relayed similar findings with uh, chip seals that uh, you could get the same sort of abrasion loss or uh, something like that for a wrap aggregate as you would expect with a virgin aggregate. So uh, very similar uh, processes, tests, results, all those things that we would be thinking about for a, a mixed design for these treatments. Uh, so again, they verified that you do have often for those uh, slurry and micro products a lower optimum asphalt content uh, of virgin emulsion being added into those into those mixes. They also hinted that there needs to be an analysis done of the uh, chemical package that the emulsion is bringing in. That because these treatments take a little bit longer to set up, there needs to be some uh, adapting of the, the chemical package in the emulsion to uh, account for that and try to not inhibit this set and uh, curing any more than uh, would otherwise occur. So what we found looking at their data is, uh, I know this uh, slide is small, I'll blow it up a little bit if I can, uh, but the uh, this table is available in your uh, in the report if you want to download it. Uh, doesn't look like I can resize this. Uh, but basically, they're looking at very similar design criteria using the ISSA uh, design bulletin for wet track abrasion tests, uh, the monolayer loaded wheel test, for, um, and the um, multi-layer loaded wheel test for the microsurface materials. Uh, you see the optimum emulsion content there. Uh, specified as 11 and a half, 12, 12 and a half, which these may be um, identified as uh, 13 and a half to 15 percent using a virgin uh, aggregate source. So uh, again, that one and a half to two percent uh, below what what typically would happen with a virgin aggregate. Uh, but you see, ultimately the the amount of asphalt con the, the amount of asphalt that those mixtures have in it is higher than what you would have with just 65 percent of uh, 15. Say that would just be 10 percent residual asphalt, whereas these mixtures have uh, 14 to 16 percent. So, uh, just considering that as a potential benefit, we didn't find. Uh, a lot of information out there to verify that, but generally it's thought that the, the more asphalt you can get into your mixtures uh, stably, the, the longer uh, life or more flexible that, that material is going to be over time. So uh, in San Bernardino County, California, that was one of our case study areas, we found that, that they were using uh, wrap aggregate chip seals, um, and they were their, their model is they place the materials with an internal crew, so in-house uh, chip seal application. They hire the aggregate to be delivered to the job site. So they put out a bid and they ask for aggregate suppliers to deliver the materials to within uh, either to the chip spreader or to be stockpiled. Uh, close to where the materials are going to be placed. Um, the uh, supervisor that I was talking to there said, you know, San Bernardino County is the largest county in the United States. We have uh, very diverse uh, conditions. We go from the desert to the mountains. We have uh, a lot of different climate zones and uh, 
so we do chip seals in all those areas, and uh, there's quite a bit of variability there. So <clears throat> they were accepting wrap materials as an alternative to the virgin aggregates uh, to provide some bid competition. And this is one of those instances where uh, materials were having to be delivered from uh, many, many miles away, 50, 60, 70 miles was not uncommon for some of their uh, haul distances, according to the uh, superintendent there. And in some of their bid packages, uh, they were seeing some significant cost savings uh, by allowing that wrap aggregate to uh, compete with virgin aggregate. So in uh, a couple of contracts that I evaluated, there was a 30% cost savings there. So uh, that was largely an alternative uh, option that they pursued to increase competition in the area. So that is one of the advantages. Uh, Los Angeles County, uh, California was by far the largest user of wrap surface treatments that I could identify. Um, and they were very open with us about why they were doing it. They identified uh, a, a public campaign that they had uh, entered into defining the sustainability of their practices. Uh, and so using RAP was one of their alternatives for that. Uh, they also found that the, the performance of these treatments was very similar. Uh, they use uh, you know, they produced this graphic showing how many tons of material uh, they had reclaimed and reused and what the, what the benefits of using uh, preventive maintenance treatments was. So a very good public relations campaign uh, really geared toward the sustainability of their program, not just uh, recycling types of sustainability, but how, how that um, relates to cost and budget and, and being a uh, sustainable practice that minimizes the use of virgin materials. Uh, and so their, uh, the evolution of their practices uh, where they started with testing different treatments and ended up adopting uh, a treatment of micro milling, uh, scrub sealing on top of the micro mill, uh, and then uh, applying a slurry seal. And, and they did this on a lot of residential roads. They also used uh, chip seals as a, as a treatment in some areas and uh, microsurface on some of their uh, arterials. So the, uh, they have been doing this for quite a while and have developed uh, specifications that are being included, I believe, in the Green Book. Uh, that was one of their goals anyway, was to get them into the uh, Southern California standard specification. So uh, that is one of the resources that we point you to if you're looking for design procedures that deal with wrap in, in surface treatments. Um, LA County and uh, the California Green Book are both uh, evolving in that, in that regard, but checking the the most current Los Angeles County bid package for pavement preservation would be where I would start to get a, uh, a good idea of design specifications uh, and um, construction specifications as well for these treatments. They cover all, all four of those. Uh, when we ask them about performance, uh, they reference the ability to go into their pavement management system and to compare uh, the condition of treatments that were placed with all virgin aggregates uh, and to follow up with uh, treatments that were placed uh, with wrap aggregate treatments. Now these were different areas, but it was it was very common climate, um, condition of pavements to start off with. so there was there was some engineering analysis that was done looking at the condition uh, before treatment and after treatment. Uh, for both the uh, wrap treatment and the, uh, the virgin aggregate treatment. So um, this is a, a picture of Van and, uh, looking at some of the distress there on 
uh, one of the routes he was introducing me to. Uh, but LA County, again, they have a specification uh, for the design, production, uh, construction practices, acceptance, all those things. They've got a, a document available they're willing to share uh, and to tell their story. So they're very open uh, as an agency to helping other people do this. Uh, they use a job order contract uh, using that green book as the basis. So they, they have a, a special provision that builds on the green book where uh, the, the standard doesn't address uh, wrap exactly the way they they want to, so they're uh, in a, in many cases they are specifying wrap treatments to be used. So that is specifically in their scrub seal and in their slurry treatments. They allow replacement of the aggregate in microsurfacing, so they allow up to 100 percent wrap to replace that virgin aggregates for microsurfacing treatment. Uh, but the thing I saw in their practice is that they uh, require quality acceptance testing for their pavement preservation treatments. So they require materials to be sampled uh, for their slurry seals in particular, and then to go back and run the uh, wet track abrasion test with that field produced uh, material and to adjust payment uh, based on uh, conformance with the specification. So they had a minimum uh, number of grams that could be lost and, and that sort of thing. So they were using an analytical testing scheme to uh, accept these treatments, which I thought was pretty progressive uh, from a pavement preservation standpoint. So uh, I really encourage you to, to uh, look at those specifications if you want to get into the the wrap business uh, in your pavement preservation program. Uh, again, mentioning their specifications, I won't dwell on these, but there are uh, requirements on the asphalt content, the minimum residual asphalt percentage, uh, the percentage wear for aggregates, sand equivalent, soundness, durability, uh, the wet track abrasion test, again, consistency, extraction, water content. Um, all of those parts are, uh, you can see the comparison there between a, a wrap slurry seal requirement and a virgin type 2 slurry seal requirement. Uh, the interesting thing about their um, specification is how they deal with the gradation. Uh, because wrap is what it is, uh, their gradation band tolerances are a little bit wider than what your standard ISSA uh, gradation bands are for the different types of materials, especially your, your um, slurry and micro. Uh, because think about it, these, these wrap particles, when you have a, an aggregate that's retained on a sieve, it's going to have those very small particles adhered to the outside. So uh, also comparing a a gradation that's measured by just washing is going to show up a little bit differently, generally more coarse than if you uh, extract that material or run it through your furnace and, and get rid of the asphalt cement around the edges. So uh, just be aware that the gradation is not going to be the same uh, based on those um, criteria. Um, our next case study was with pavement coatings. This is a, a producer of uh, treatments and an applicator of treatments. Uh, they were very open to us again, and, and basically the, um, their findings were that these treatments worked very well. Um, and they were really in the business of uh, building the market share for RAP and uh, did a very good job of communicating with um, with agencies and talking about the, the best practices and uh, how well this material could work for, for folks and uh, what cost savings they may identify. Um, 
one thing that pavement coatings identified as a an issue is that their uh, coarse aggregate pile. I'm going to try to turn my pointer on here. Their coarse aggregate used for chip seals is that little bitty pile over there on the back side, whereas the wrap fines pile is this great big pile. So what we hear often from aggregate producers is we have an abundance of the fines material building up, and we're uh, using uh, almost all of the coarse aggregate material that we're producing. So. Um, that is uh, one of the issues that they see that the, the chip seals are much more uh, popular with folks than, than perhaps the slurries or micros for a, uh, as a balanced approach. The issue, again, that they were trying to address with agencies is uh, the impression that this aggregate is not dirty. Uh, this is a, a premium quality material that has asphalt cement on the outside, and so it has those little particles adhered to it. So this is not a dirty aggregate. It's an engineered um, material that has been um, subjected to quality control and design processes in order to get you a good, uh, a good uh, product. So uh, I didn't touch on the um, New Mexico DOT experience, but it was largely similar to uh, what San Bernardino County uh, found uh, using wrap chip seals worked very well for them. Uh, the significant con conclusions that we found is that wrap uh, may be a cost-effective alternative depending on what the business climate is in your area, uh, in particular who owns the wrap. Do the owners of the wrap intend to use it in uh, plant mixed asphalt? It may not be a, uh, a competitive commodity that can be used in your pavement preservation surface treatment program. Uh, if it is available, uh, it can be a cost effective alternative. Uh, the, the chip seal experience that, that is out there says that there are very uh, minute alterations that need to happen in order to perform comparatively. So the, the chip seal design process is largely the same. Uh, it reacts very similar to using a pre-coated uh, aggregate chip. So it's um, it adheres well. It remains black, dark. It gives you good contrast with your pavement markings. Uh, that sort of thing. So this is an example from, um, in, in this particular example, I see a question there about fog sealing on top of the wrap chips. This is an example of that very treatment. This is a, a wrap chip seal that was placed on a road in San Bernardino County, and then it was fogged over, and then the lines were uh, traced back on top there. So with the uh, uh, script in front of the, in advance of the railroad crossing. So yes, fog sealing wrap uh, chip seals is a uh, possibility and a recommendation uh, if you would normally fog seal your chip seals. Uh, wrap and slurry and microsurfacing treatments require generally reduced emulsion content. Uh, and so that is uh, one of the findings. We also found that uh, in LA County, they like to have a pneumatic tire roller uh, roll their slurries and micros after they've set, just to uh, seat that aggregate a little more. Uh, so that's one of the construction nuances they've uh, adapted. Uh, but what we found is that wrap in surface treatments is a rapidly progressing technology. Uh, as we got more familiar with uh, people and we began to talk about this study more and more, uh, people were coming out of the woodwork talking about, well, we've done wrap chip seals in New York, and we've done it for years in Pennsylvania, and uh, a lot of things, uh, Texas, uh, one of the agencies in Texas is looking at uh, wrap slurries. So uh, there are a lot of people looking at 
using rapid surface treatments and uh, just are encouraged that um, this is a, um, a practice that's gaining um, broader use. Uh, recommendations moving forward, uh, I think we still need to identify needs. Uh, the, the needs that we identified uh, from what the state of the practice was between 2016 and, and 2019 when the uh, paper was completed uh, is that we need to characterize that wrap asphalt and the emulsion interaction. How especially in our um, micros and slurries, how does that interact? Um, and what are the long-term performance capabilities of these wrap treatment in multiple climate zones? We only saw um, use largely in California and uh, New Mexico, so we're, we're seeing uh, just those localized areas being the hotbeds for these treatments. So uh, really trying to summarize what it does in other locations. Uh, some of the some of the discussion that we had early on with practitioners is it really depends on what the source asphalt was in your wrap materials. So in California, they use that AR uh, grading or did in the past. And so uh, perhaps that contributed to the asphalt in that wrap being a little bit more applicable for these, these treatments. So. Uh, in a in a more humid environment, what what are the what are the criteria? What are the conditions? So, uh, good good discussion there about uh, what needs to be further characterized to ensure this works uh, in multiple locations across the country. But uh, we generally find that that the uh, the use is is increasing rapidly. So if you'd like to download the project report, that's the location. I'm sure Jason will type that into the, into the chat box. And um, I think that's my last slide. Yes. So Jason, I'll, uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. I'll uh, trust you to advance us as we need to. So. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to answering more questions. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'm all, while we're, we're we got a, we got some time toward the end to maybe answer some more questions, but I'm going to roll it over to our next speaker and do a little introduction here. I'd like, now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Cross. Dr. Cross serves as a technical director for the Asphalt Recycling and Reclaiming Association, ARRA, serving as the point of contact for technical information on each of the ARA's core disciplines, including cold planning, hot in place recycling, cold recycling, and full depth reclamation. He is, the, he is a co author of AIR's Basic Asphalt Recycling Manual and an emeritus professor at the School of Civil Engineering environmental engineering at the Oklahoma State University. Dr. Cross, on behalf of PPRA and FHWA, I want to thank you for your time today. I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to you. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, Steve. I'm going to take that as a yes. So, um, previous speaker, we heard about the wrap with paper preservation technique. And depending on where you are in the country, you sometimes have an overabundance of wrap and sometimes scarcity. But I'm going to show you another uh, way that you can wrap. And uh, whether it ends up being technically a paper preservation technique or not, it kind of depends on where you decide to place the thing. Hey, Steve, sorry to interrupt you. You're, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. So if you can go a little closer to the mic, I'd appreciate it. Uh, is this better? We'll, we'll see what we got here. Uh, so air uh, classifies as two different types of coal, coal recycling. There's cold in place, cold in place recycling, uh, which is also called partial depth cold in place recycling, and then there's cold central plant recycling. So uh, 
Coal to place recycling is uh, basically restricted to the asphalt pavement and minor amounts of the base. Uh, we typically come in and pulverize the existing pavement anywhere from three to five inches in a single pass, although there have been some low volume roads where they've gone deeper than that. Uh, we're going to size the wrap. We're going to add a recycling agent, uh, which is either going to be emulsified asphalt or foamed asphalt. Uh, we might add uh, lime or cement. Mix of components, uh, place and compact the mixture all as we're going down the road. And due to the higher in place air voids, these do require some type of a surface course. Uh, comparing that to cold central plant recycling, then uh, cold central plant recycling is a viable alternative when I have stockpiles of high quality wrapper available. Or occasionally we run into places where it's not possible uh, to in place recycle the pavement. And then we'll use a uh, central mix plant. Or a lot of times uh, we'll park the single unit, I'm sorry, the multi unit CIR train and uh, set it up in a stationary mode and create a cold central plant mix there. So, you know, kind of a description of a cold central plant mix. I want to take clean wrap and I'm going to turn, turn it into a new pavement mix. And so I want to follow good stockpile uh, techniques and keep my wrap clean. I'm more than likely going to have to crush that wrap uh, to a gradation. Uh, we're going to mix it with a bituminous recycling agent again. This will be, again, either be emulsified asphalt or foamed asphalt. And I'm going to transport it to a lay down place, pave it, pack it and it's ready for a surface treatment. So in all honesty, there's really very, very little difference between a cold in place recycled mix and a cold central plant mix. It just has to do with what do you do with the wrap. In one, I mill the pavement up, I run it through a train, and I put it right back down. With cold central plant, we've milled the wrap, we've hauled it to a central location, and then we haul it back. But other than that, there's really no difference between the two. Um, one of the things that you can do with uh, cold central plant mixes, you can actually do these with uh, cold in place mixes. It's a little bit more difficult, but we will occasionally fractionate the wrap and or add new aggregate. And I put in there if required. And, and that's one of the things you want to be careful with. Um, if I start adding aggregate, uh, we want to make sure that it's cost effective, that it's uh, Necessary according to the mix design because if you add new, you, you do run the cost up. You know, a coated aggregate that you put in there will drive up the binder demand and increase the cost. And we want to make sure that uh, that's worth the additional cost. But it is occasionally done. Uh, the biggest question we usually come up with with, with cold central plant is, is two things that I'm going to address. One is where can I use it, and the second one is how does it perform. And so there's basically three types of uh, cold central plant recycling operations. Uh, the most common is by far the central plant facility. And this is where we've milled wrap from various roadways, you know, and we stockpile them at a central location, typically an asphalt plant, for later use. Um, and then they're just taken and uh, put back on another project somewhere. So the MCHRP 951 study, where they looked at CCPR mixes, CIR mixes, and bituminous stabilized SDR, FDR mixes, uh, said they all had dy dynamic modulus values similar to Virginia DOT's one-inch nominal superpaid mix. And so basically, you can put it anywhere where you would place a binder or base mix. Uh, it does require a wearing surface. But other than that, um, the other type is a central facility where we're going to, uh, that's going to be real, built from the railway to be reconstructed. We're going to haul it to a close temporary processing site. And we're going to process it and put it back on the same road. Um, where we've seen this used, and I'll show you a couple of uh, examples. It can be used with cold in place recycling to allow uh, deeper treatments. Uh, let's say I have a, a pavement that's got 8 to 10 inches of uh, hot mix asphalt on it that's thermally cracked. 
and I want to get down there and, and get as much of that crack uh, taken out as I can, then I can combine CIR with CCPR to do that. And then we've used it with either base stabilization or uh, FDR on a pavement where uh, it really needs to be reconstructed. And we have to get down to the base, and we don't want to just haul off all that uh, wrap. Uh, we can turn around and put it back on the mix as a CCPR mix. So my first example is using uh, CIR with CCPR. And this was a project out in Utah. Uh, you can see up at the top, it was uh, had very bad thermal cracks. They were quite wide. The road was quite rough, and they had very little amount of money to try to repair the road. And so what they did is they came in and then milled off three inches of uh, the existing asphalt pavement and uh, stockpiled it at a central location on the project. The project was about eight and a half uh, miles long. And then after they did that, they came in and they uh, did cold in place recycling for the next three inches. And so after they had uh, cold, cold in place recycled and put the mix back down and compacted it, they went back and uh, parked the train at that central location and processed and, and made a cold central plant mix out of those same millings. And then they placed it back on top uh, and then put a chip seal on top of the road. So it was a project where they were able to do eight and a half miles at a cost of uh, $3.2 million, uh, which has worked out and performed quite well for them. Uh, the second example, we see this sometimes in lower volume roads. Now, this was a road in Indiana. Well, the road was basically worn out and needed to be widened, and uh, there were some base issues as well. So what they decided to do was uh, come in and mill off. Well, the finished project would be 10 inches of cement FDR, 6 inches of CCPR with a 2-inch asphalt overlay on it. Uh, as far as it, that's a little better picture of the existing pavement, it was in pretty bad shape. So the first thing they did was they milled off the existing asphalt um, all into a central location and stockpiled it. And then they came in and they performed a 10-inch FDR where they took the aggregate base and some of the subgrade in there, used cement, and uh, stabilized that and then spread it wider. So they took the 10-foot uh, road and was able to uh, uh, widen the road that way. Then they uh, processed the, the wrap through a CCPR mix, um, hauled it back out, and uh, then I believe they put uh, two inches of hot mix back on top of it. So in this project, there was 17.24 lane miles, um, and you can see the cost. Um, the FDR with CCPR was a little under $5 million. The estimate of completely rebuilding the pavement, sorry, uh, was nearly $12 million, so it was a substantial uh, cost savings by doing this, a very economical way to allow you to get down deep and do a deeper treatment. The third type um, is imported CCPR, and that's where we're going to take wrap. Uh, from one road uh, and haul it to a close temporary processing site uh, and then put it on a different road. Uh, so it's all done at once. It's not moved around too much. And that's been done once or twice, but in all honesty, it's not that, not that common. So as far as the other one that comes up is project selection. And I'm going to show you a couple of resources where you can find some more information on this, and then we'll talk a little bit about performance. Uh, but you can go to either the basic uh, asphalt recycling manual or ERA's new uh, PPRA's new webpage, uh, www.roadresource.org. And in uh, the, the Basic Asphalt Recycling Manual in Chapter 10, the project selection for coal recycling. Uh, we have a table there that lists surface defects and then tells you uh, uh, whether coal recycling is applicable. And honestly, this, this table uh, addresses a little bit more CIR, but it does talk about CCPR as well. 
And the same table is in roadresource.org. Uh, it's under the Treatment Toolbox. A little hard to find. Treatment Toolbox, Treatment Resource Center, under CCTR, and then Pre-Construction and Site Selection. You can find the same table. But the nice thing about the table is it gives you notes as well as to whether it can mitigate the distress or there might be something else you need to do to handle the distress. And then if you look at roadresource.org, um, you can go to the treatment toolbox, and you can come to a section that says, which treatment is right for my road? And there's two different ways you can do this. And one way is what you're seeing here on the screen is pavement condition. Uh, there's a spot where you can enter your uh, pavement condition index, your major distress. You can enter the road type and surface type. But in all honesty, for ARIS treatments, those really don't come into play. It's just the pavement condition and the primary distress. And over on the left, those are all the treatments that are covered. And the ones that are applicable will stand out, and the others will fade away. And you can click on those, and it will take you for more information to show you what, uh, what treatment might be right for that distress. We also have a photo selector. So this, uh, we have distress photos that are categorized by pavement distress. You look at one and you decide, gee, my road looks a little bit like this. You can click on that uh, photograph, and it will give you some different ideas as to what treatments might be applicable. Uh, give you a little warning on this one, though, realizing that uh, one photograph from one spot might not tell you everything that's going on with your road, and you can't always tell what's going on with your road by just looking at the surface. Uh, but it will give you a general idea. If you were to click on one of those treatments or go to the Treatment Resource Center, uh, you would come to this page. And this page shows all the treatments that are covered in roadresource.org. Uh, the green ones and the yellow ones are mine. So there's cold planting and micro milling, hot in place recycling, cold in place recycling, cold central plant recycling, full depth reclamation and base stabilization and soil stabilization. If you were to click on any one of those, it would take you to a series of pages um, that would have all kinds of information. It's quite comprehensive. It's, uh, it's basically the, uh, the basic asphalt recycling unit. Uh, another place you can go for information and more information is uh, ERA has developed a series of best practice guides. They're available for uh, cold planting and micro milling. Uh, cold in place recycling, cold central plant recycling, and FDR. And they are a series of three different series. Uh, there's the 100 series, which is construction best practice guidelines. They're written in uh, suggested specification language. There's a 200 series, which is project sampling and mixed design guidelines. And uh, there are uh, two. Uh, AASHTO provisional mixed design procedures for coal recycled mixtures, one using emulsified asphalt and the other using foamed asphalt. And these were, those were basically developed from ERA's uh, 200 series. And then the 300 series is uh, a QC guidelines, so recommended quality control checks and remedial, remedial actions. And they all provide user notes uh, for more information. And all of these are available on the ERA's web page, uh, as well as on roadresource.org. As far as performance, uh, this is another thing that comes up occasionally. Uh, and Virginia DOT has actually done more with CCTR than anybody. It's put down more miles or tonnage than this is than anyone. And the first project they did this on was uh, I-81 in Virginia. And then they went down to the NCAT test track and repeated those sections. So they had four inches of asphalt on five inches of CCPR with eight inches of FDR base. Um, so that section, after eight years and 29 million e soles, is, had absolutely no distress and they believe it was performing as a perpetual pavement. Uh, the other two sections were four inches and six inches of asphalt over five inches of CCPR. And they lasted eight years again and took 29 million easels, but they were beginning to start to show some distress. But the bottom line is with the CCPR mix, if you, uh, or a CIR mix, if you have a good stable base underneath it and put an adequate uh, wearing surface on top of it, they can perform uh, quite well. 
the other thing they did out at Auburn, they've had the uh, Lee Road Preservation Study on, on Lee Road 159, and they had one little 50-foot section that they didn't know what to do, so Buzz Powell decided to put down a uh, 5-inch and CCPR mix, and he overlaid that with a 3-quarter inch HMA thin line. Uh, it was placed in 2012. I probably need to update this slide because it's had over 1.3 million uses on it. And it's actually performed quite well. Um, had uh, less than 4% low severity cracking, uh, almost no rutting. The IRI is actually a little high at 120, but uh, it was put down in a series of little 50 foot sections, so that's a little unfair, but there's really been no increase in the IRI over time. So, all in all, uh, for, a low, for basically a low volume road, uh, it's been performing really well with just a three quarter inch asphalt overlay on it. So, the question then that came up down at NCAT was kind of how, not how low we could go, but how thin we could go. So, they went out on US 280 which is uh, just outside Auburn over in Opelika. There's a four-lane divided highway. It has a little over 18,000 ADT with 16% trucks. And they put down four test sections. They put down two CCPR sections and two CIR sections. Uh, each of those are four inches thick, over four inches of existing asphalt underneath that, and they got a one-inch HMA thin lay on top of it. Um, They've had about uh, a little over 3.2 million easels. Uh, as far as cracking, all the sections are performing good. IRI, they're all good. Uh, one, the CCR, CCPR with foam and the uh, EIR with emulsion have just dropped out of the uh, good section into the fair section in rutting. Uh, but Buzz has told me there's really no concern yet on rutting. Uh, but I will point out, with that much traffic, uh, that might be a little bit thin on that asphalt overlay. That's one of the things we're trying to determine from this set. So in summary, uh, CIR and CCPR are economical, sustainable construction and maintenance procedures. Uh, CIR is best suited for cracked pavements with sound bases. Uh, CCPR can be considered anywhere where we'll replace a multi-mid HMA. And CIR and CCPR, because of the high airboard structure, will require some type of a wearing surface. As far as some additional resources, there's actually been a lot of work on uh, coal recycle mixes. So I did tell you that there are mix design procedures out there for uh, coal recycled mixes, the CIR or CCPR. There's one for emulsion. There's one for foam. Uh, I alerted you about our best practice guides. Uh, there are a lot of state DOTs that do have construction specifications. Uh, I will point out that there is an NCHRP project going on right now, 14-43. That's going to write construction specifications and a best practice guide for Cold in place and cold central plant mixes. Uh, as far as some existing uh, national research, there's the NCHRP uh, 951 study where they looked at uh, basically dynamic modulus properties and really found there was no difference in those. Uh, NCHRP 962 is wrapping up, and that's where they've developed a rapid test uh, for when you can open a project to. Uh, the initial traffic and place the overlay. Uh, we talked about the NCAT uh, and the UTRC sections. NRRA up at uh, Nimrod has put down in this last year some sections using FDR, and CIR, and CCPR, uh, but they haven't really had that much traffic yet, so I didn't mention those, but information is available on those. Um, some other uh, resources, we've already talked about road resource, but as far as training resources, there's the NHI course, uh, 131050, been recently updated. Uh, there are three excellent uh, TC3 courses, uh, especially for people that are going to go out and inspect projects if they're not uh, familiar with that. Uh, there's one on HIR, or hot in place, one on cold in place, and one on FDR. Um, and you can find these just by Googling the TC3 course on HIR, CIR, FDR. 
But as far as some helpful links, we did write a, uh, there's a checklist series uh, for uh, pocket guides for uh, CIR and CCPR. Uh, there's, uh, if you want to know a little bit about the sustainability, we have several reports on our web resource webpage on that, but here's another one by the Recycled Material Resource Center uh, touting the environmental benefits, uh, CIR and CCPR. And then this is a little uh, advertisement for an upcoming session. Uh, Indiana DOT has a really good flow chart for when you might use CIR, CCPR, or FDR. And we're going to have the guys from Indiana DOT present this in August at an upcoming webinar. So uh, the link's there if you want to see this, but uh, I'd ask if you're interested. Uh, I think this will be a really good webinar and encourage you to attend. So that's it for me. Uh, the next thing that's coming up uh, next month will be storage and handling of asphalt emulsions. So, uh, Jason, do we have any uh, questions we need to answer? Yeah, I just wanted to give Allie and Ann a chance to talk a little bit about the storage and handling asphalt emulsion upcoming webinar. Allie, All right. Ann? Thanks, Jason. Yeah, thank you. And thank you again to our presenters, Greg and Steve. We appreciate you taking the time to share with us today. As Steve said, the next webinar in the series will be held on May 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and it will focus on the storage and handling of asphalt emulsions, with Sam Squirt presenting on that, and we encourage everyone to join us. So to, to learn more and register, you can visit roadresource.org, and with that, we'll pass it back over to you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, here's some contact information for both Greg and Steve. And uh, while we got a little time, I'm going to, we're going to answer questions as well as we're also going to open up evaluations for folks to, if they have to leave early, uh, if they could please take the time and go through the evaluations, we'd appreciate it. So now we kind of open it up for anybody with questions. Um, Feel free, uh, you can take your phone off mute or feel free to use chat pod. I know there was a question regarding, I'm gonna go back, unfortunately my chat's not showing here the previous questions. Yeah, I thought I saw one on, uh, someone had a question possibly on layer coefficients, but I couldn't read all of it. I saw that one, Steve. It was our CCPR and CIR layer coefficients the same? Uh, yes. Um, we very typically recommend you use uh, somewhere in the order of, of 0.35 or 0.36 uh, for a layer coefficient. Um, there's been some research, uh, some of the work out of Virginia in the 1951, and, and uh, some ink that shows that might be a little bit conservative, uh, but for now we're still pretty happy with that. We're just waiting for more research on that. But no, there's honestly little to no difference between a CIR and a CCP. All right, thank you. I see there was a question on the, the CIR. Go, Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jason. You're fine. Go ahead. Um, the, there was a question on the uh, EIR plus CCPR mix where they did the FDR as well, uh, and the project was done with a multiplied asphalt. As far as quality control for the pavement using CCPR, I would tell you to take a look at ERA's uh, CR301 that gives us our recommended quality control plan. But uh, you can check gradation. You certainly want to check uh, any additive and, and finer contents, uh, check placement depth, and check compaction. Steve, there was a question also as as well as re, as a rejuvenator in a CCPR. Have you seen rejuvenator oils being used? Um, and how? With some of the engineered emulsions, and, and Greg might 
you know, a little more about this, they sometimes add a, uh, a little bit of a rejuvenating agent to it. Uh, there's a lot of interest right now of people trying to make mixes with uh, they're using higher rejuvenating rejuvenating oils or rejuvenating agents. Um, so there's interest in it. Um, I, I don't really think I have time to give you guys. The, well, I will throw you my my concern about rejuvenating oils. Re, we're using rejuvenating agents. And, of course, to be sure that they'll stay in there. And we want to be careful. A lot of people want to add this so they can get um, lower air boards. And we do want to be really careful that we don't take a mix that's performing well and put something in it that runs it into the uh, air board range to where we start seeing poor performance in hot mix. So right now, uh, uh, it's interesting work. Uh, it's moving forward. Uh, but I don't see a lot of it being used. Steve Merlin had a question along with that. Is is there a process of how that rejuvenator is added to that CCPR mixture? Is uh, it before the I, emulsion is added? Or the only way I've idea? seen it seen it done in an actual other than in a research project was it's something that the uh, emulsion supplier uh, might add a little bit of a rejuvenated agent to his emulsion. Just incorporated in with the emulsion. It's not incorporated separate. Neil had a question about that CIR project that you had plus CCPR or CCPR six inches deep project done with foamed asphalt. Is, is that correct? No, it was with emulsified asphalt. Thank you. There was also a question oh. regarding that FHWA. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and see finish it. I have a question. No, I, I was else. I was done. No, ask me another question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. There was a publication, an epic study publication, the link appendix B. Uh, a person had a hard time uh, not opening it. Is it working? So and Jason, I believe it was working when the report was published. I'll I'll try to get you a copy of that, and you can send it to the respondents. Is that the participants. And also, Greg, up above, if people look on the chat, um, there is the uh, use of reclaimed asphalt. And I'll, and I'll pass that report along with the, uh, with the PowerPoint presentations, and that I'll include that for everybody. How about that? Okay. Make it easier. Yep. I'll get it to you. Thanks, Greg. All right. Uh, there were a couple of uh, questions for you, Greg, on uh, the wrap. And, Sally and Sean had some questions regarding just basically material issues on that, on that gradation for that wrap uh, proceeds to use a chip seal. What is the gradation for that wrap process for use in chip seal? Is there a, do they have a gradation limit on that? So most of the chip seals that we evaluated was a, uh, both the, uh, um, New Mexico, the San Bernardino County, and Los Angeles County, they were all using a 3 8 inch uh, uniformly sized chip for chip seals. So yes, there is a there is a gradation spec band in the uh, LA County uh, contract document, I think. Green, green book? I think I saw that yesterday as I was helping a few other agencies about Scary Seal. Sally had There's actually another, a, a, go ahead. I was just going to say there was another question about uh, what would be the wrap fines pile gradation. Uh, and yes, it was very close to a ISSA top two aggregate, except it was a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I have to preface this, the washed gradation was a little bit on the coarse side of a top two, and the extracted gradation was a little bit on the fine side because we're, we're breaking those bonds where the fine particles are adhered to the, um, 
the larger particles. They're not they're all fine particles, but the really fine ones are adhered to the to the bigger particles and, and when you extract it they break apart or they they uh, become singular particles then and show up as a higher percent passing the 100, 200 and so forth. So now that's what we see. The, the tolerances are just a little bit larger. Um, I, I can't speak to specifics, but, but the uh, bands are included in the, in the report. The tables are there. Any other questions that you see, Jason? I know Sally had one up at close uh, regarding ISSA gradation. Um, the aggregate for the wrap slurry usually has lower fines and are bound up to the wrap. Agree. Do you need to meet the ISSA gradation with that uh, the amount of fines bound to that wrap? Yeah, so my, my opinion is no. You don't have to meet the ISSA gradation necessarily. Uh, agencies do set their own specifications, though, so that would be that would be the target that I would look for. I know there has been some research looking at blending wrap fines with virgin fines uh, to make um, you know to meet some of the mixture properties that are required for uh, loss and uh, the loaded wheel test and that sort of thing. So. Uh, there are alternatives that you can uh, do with the mixes to to help improve the properties if your wrap is not meeting the mix design. Uh, but that those are uh, issues that have to be worked out during the design process. Chris had a question too, question. Greg, about about um, what would be the wrap science pile gradation. He didn't understand right. That. Uh, yeah, the wrap pile gradation is uh, is largely, you know, it's a it's a product of what you're doing to the wrap as you're processing it. So if you're if you're crushing it uh, versus just uh, screening it with a high frequency screen, you could be altering the gradation from what it is. Um, so when I say the, the gradation of your wrap pile is what it is, uh, you can't make it any bigger. If you, if you want it to be bigger, you would just have to screen out a, a higher percentage of that material to be wasted, perhaps, or, uh, or to become the fines portion. But from what I've seen where the, the split is on the 3 eighths of an inch, the coarse material comes off as that three eighths of an inch uh, coarse chip, and the fines then uh, appear to be very similar to a top two ISSA gradation. I see uh, others uh, working in there. It really depends on what your source pile looks like for your your wrap and how you're processing it. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, there's a, an easy question or another question down at the, uh, the bottom of the list. Any concern about wrap generated from pavement replacement at diesel spills? And, and I would say yes. I, would I will concern. second that one. <laughs> yes, yeah. we don't want to do that. And I guess they got another question for you, Steve. Was the CIR plus CCPR project done with foam asphalt? You might have answered that one already. Um, both of those that I that I listed as uh, uh, examples were done with emulsified asphalt. Uh, the stuff that was done out in Virginia uh, was done with foamed asphalt, and I believe the, the CCPRs on the NCAT test track, I believe, were foamed asphalt as well. Great. Well, we got about three minutes left, and I, I want to give you guys an opportunity to say any last words, uh, Greg and Steve. So please, free free. I, I just want to say thank you, Jason, for the opportunity to present. There, there were a lot of ISA, ISSA, and other uh, 
organization members who weighed into this research and helped us prepare the report. So uh, I am uh, very grateful to those folks who participated in doing this and thankful for the opportunity to be here. So uh, please reach out if you have any questions. I'm, I'm uh, glad to uh, try to help. Thank you. Well, I just appreciate the chance to be here uh, and uh, encourage everybody to take a look at that roadresource.org webpage. There's a tremendous amount of information there, lots of good links to other other information. And uh, one of the big questions we have often with in place recycling is where can I use it? And so I uh, let everybody know, I believe it's in August, that we'll have the Indiana DOT talking about their. Uh, their, their spreadsheet and their decision tree for deciding where to use in place recycling thing. So, other than that, I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Greg. Also on the file share is the presentation material that was uh, given today in PDF, as well as upcoming webinars, uh, a flyer for those you can put in your office, and webinars that were done last year in case you didn't have any chance not to make them. There's an opportunity you can go back in there and watch some of the recordings. With that, um, we got a few minutes left. I just ask if you all could please take the time to do your evaluations and, and wrap it up for today. I really appreciate it. Everybody, take care and and uh, until next time. Thank you. And this does conclude our conference for today. We thank you for your participation in using AT&T teleconference service. You may now disconnect.